Um, okay, my name is Martin Mills. I'm a university senator at the University of Aberdeen. It is my fourth term, four-year term as a senator, so I'm getting rather long in the tooth on this one. Um, <clears throat> the Reclaim movement emerges from an argument that occurred about one and a half years ago, um, which was largely about how to deal with what was perceived to be a, a constant rain of administrative initiatives that were falling upon us, you know, kind of, uh, sort of like, like a monsoon. Um, and that we seem to have no way of turning around or dealing with or addressing or answering or even rejecting. Um, and on top of issues such as, for example, redundancies and everything on those lines, there was a great debate as to what was to be done. Uh, effectively, the debate occurred um, that involved two different sides. One was a side that spoke of uh, a grassroots campaign to reclaim the university, um, which emerged in terms of the manifesto and in terms of the seminars that were associated with that. The other view was that the core to the, the issue was to reassert the established constitutional position of core university organs of governance, most specifically Senate, and that Senate constituted the key to the issue of effectively speaking um, proper, proper governance within a university system. Um, I'm an advocate of the second approach because I'm a senator. Um, the issue largely surrounded, and here I speak for myself and my own understanding of the matter because it's been a, a long year of work. Um, it revolved around an, uh, an instinct that basically over the last 30 odd years, particularly within the UK, the higher education sector has seen something of a revolution. And that revolution has been a single dynamic with two results. The first result is to effectively take the administrations that once upon a time served the needs of an academic community and move them up to the point where, effectively speaking, they governed the strategic direction of UK universities and effectively as a consequence of, as it were, being up there, they looked upwards to serve the needs of largely government and economic forces, stakeholders, and so on and so forth. In other words, the needs came from the outside, and those kind of moved down. Um, most of you will be familiar with, with, with that picture. Uh, and you'll be familiar with the problems that are associated with it. Uh, the most substantial problem with that is a very simple one. None of us can encapsulate the intellectual, academic, and scientific activity of the university within our, any university within our brains. In fact, no small group can ever do that thing. A university is simply too diverse. A proper university has so many multiple systems of teaching, research, authorship, um, ethics, all of these kinds of things. They are so varied that no senior management team, effectively speaking, however well-meaning, however hard-working, and however knowledgeable, can encapsulate that. The minute they try to, they will necessarily reduce the object in size. In other words, universities are reduced by this process. Okay, so that's problem number one. It's a classic problem of Popper's open society, as it were. The second is the problem that because they are responding often to external forces, um, government policies, new initiatives, changes in, uh, changes in employment percentages, changes in um, funding, re funding regimes, all of those, many of which change on a sometimes month by month basis, there is a tendency to try and make the university change with them. This is like trying to turn a super tank around in 25 yards. Effectively, what occurs is it breaks in the middle eventually. The strain on the system becomes so large that the, such a large body as a university, really, they're not that nimble. We're not small and medium-sized enterprises. We're very, very large enterprises. You know, you can turn a small co a company with about three staff around in, a, in, in 10 minutes. That's great. You can be nimble. A university cannot do that. The third problem with the, with the strategic problem, uh, the sort of the endeavor to strategically direct universities, is that university academics are professionals devoted to the pursuit of truth. I know that sounds really old fashioned, but walk in front of any university lecture hall and say to the students, 
I have no obligation to tell you the truth. And see how long they listen to your lectures. <laughs> Walk into a, research, into a research seminar and say, hmm, um, I'm just writing what I think is convenient here and what fits, the, fits this moment's policies and see how much people listen to you. Our position in the world as universities comes from that basic commitment of trust that we as academics are, have an obligation to truth. Now, the second dynamic is not only that, sort of in a sense, administration moved up to being management, it was that academics, in their own perception, moved down. They became, in their own perception, employees. And in fact, their, their commitment to truth became slightly lost in this. Because when you're committed to something, you're a professional. You profess something. A lawyer professes the law, regardless of what their employer tells them to do. A doctor professes their, their, their care for a patient, regardless of whether or not the hospital, or should profess the, <laughs> should profess the well-being of their patients, regardless of whether or not the hospital has a deal with a particular pharmaceutical company. An academic should profess their truth regardless of what their employer tells them to do. And that's a basic drag. That is the degree to which academics are professionals, not employees. Actually, by the way, um, actually under law, because most of us are largely in charge of what we do, largely in charge of what lectures we teach, what courses we teach, what research we teach, because most of us can actually ask other people to step into our lectures without asking anyone's permission, and because most of us have spent a very large quantity of our own personal money on our careers, largely in terms of books and everything on those lines. The Inland Revenue Office actually counts most of us as self-employed, but that's another matter. Um, but academics, just as much as that has moved up, academics have moved down. And what has been involved there is a fundamental abrogation of our obligation to self-government. Self-governance is the responsibility that comes with being a professional, just as lawyers are partners in a law firm. Okay? And it's necessary because of the degree to which we are not employees. But actually, in many cases, I'm sorry to say this, but this is simply my experience across four universities, most academics would rather leave it to someone else. Most academics would rather go back to their office, teach the courses they're interested in, and do the research they're interested in. Do what they like as far as that's concerned. And leave the nasty administration and governance process to someone else. Now, in the University of Aberdeen, and I hasten to add here, I'm pointing the finger entirely at myself, we did this exactly 10 years ago. There's something called um, the Senate Effectiveness Review. It is a government obligation on every university that occurs every five years. 10 years ago, the University of Aberdeen Senate said, oh, we're all, you know, we were, we were sort of vaguely, we pretty much trusted the guys upstairs. We were happy enough with it and everything on those lines. So what we did was we said, in the Senate, we said, well, we'd rather push all of this management and all of this nasty paperwork for a lot of committees to deal with rather than us. And elected senators in particular pushed it that way. And I was present that day, and I probably voted for it because I wanted to get on with my re teaching and my research. Okay? But in doing so, we effectively handed a, 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 it took all of that work to, across to a system whose committees were entirely filled with management appointees. I don't want to use that word in a pejorative sense, but it's simply ex officio officers of Senate. And as a consequence of which, very quickly we began to notice that we had lost control of the governance of our own university. And most of us kind of went away and we sort of hoped that the guys upstairs would be nice. If we were good, they'd be nice to us. It's kind of like a Santa Claus pact of a sort of strangely demonic kind. Right? And this is what we did. And Almost all academics these days, particularly following the research assessment exercise and things on those lines, is guilty of a similar temptation at least. So at the beginning of this year, we sought to reverse that process. The Centre Effectiveness Review, God bless it, it was a godsend, came in and we utilised it to revamp Senate so that any changes to the academic community had to come via it and so that it engaged much more democratically with the large, larger body of the university. 
so that, for example, uh, actually we had a pretty well structured Senate to begin with, as it were. We have 80, academic, 80 elected senators from the various schools with 40 ex officio officers in it. So that's a, that's a reasonably good balance, actually. Um, what we sought to do instead was, uh, was for example, do things like um, some very simple things, very small things, which reclaim your capacity to govern. A, a simple thing was, for example, it used to be that two days before Senate, we got the Senate papers. And they'd often be 150 to 200 pages long. We wouldn't have a chance to talk to anyone about them because we'd be busy reading them for two days. Okay? We changed that through Senate, internal Senate motions to two weeks so that we had a chance then to read the stuff, discuss it amongst ourselves, take it to our constituents who had voted for us, discuss it with them, find out what they thought. All right? So this is one of the things we instituted. We also changed the committee membership so that elected senators either from elected within Senate or directly moved up into the committees and began to change those things. Various other things occurred which honest to God I wouldn't have believed six months ago. So for example the principal no longer has a right of veto over Senate, over Senate matters. Um, we do this because we're governing. This is not a question of critique. It is not a question of protest. It is not a question of standing outside the building in the cold, hoping somebody else inside will listen. It is a question of fighting and governing. And I'm afraid to say, it's really hard work, by the way. But during that time, we have succeeded in a variety of things. For example, at the very least, those 150 redundancies didn't happen. Which I'm very pleased to say, because I think I'm on the I was on the redundancy list. Okay. <laughs> Second, we have managed to discipline almost every initiative that involves academic matters and now other matters into the purview and authority of Senate itself. So that body, which is now more democratically collected, can make those decisions. I'm afraid it does give a lot of fights in Senate, but that's what's meant to happen. Um, the um, other things are, well, there's a lot of things we've, we've, we've sent back. We often just sit there and say, we don't like this now. Can you please send it back? And can you come back with it in, in six months' time when you've rethought about it? Okay. Um, it involves a lot of work in between. And it involves us getting in people's faces and having hard discussions. Um, Senate officers, senators, elected senators have invo been involved, for example, in the near complete rewriting of our terms and conditions. That was a really long set of meetings. Um, uh, we are, you know, um, in this sense, it's, it's, it's difficult now to give a sense of how much has been achieved in a year through, effectively speaking, the core reform of Senate. We have a goal, and that goal, to a large extent, comes in the form of the manifesto. That manifesto will have to go before Senate. We will debate it. We will discuss it. We may even make some amendments. <laughs> um, but broadly speaking, this has occurred by senators working together, by actually paying attention to the system of governance around us, knowing the way it is structured, and where necessary, restructuring it. Um, never do anything by yourself, by the way. Team, tag team of five is always good. Um, you know, if you want a motion, get 20 other senators to sign it. That way, at least you'll know it makes sense. Um, in this sense, we also work with other organisations, so we, we do work with the, the Reclaim, we work with the Union. Um, but in all of these cases, we work independently, but in cooperation. We don't necessarily agree with one another. Effectively speaking, our endeavour, therefore, has been to properly build civil society within the university to ensure that senators now understand that it is their obligation to act towards governance and that it is the obligation of staff and students to beat the hell up out of their senators if they're not doing that. So that is their obligation. Everyone in this sense has an obligation. We are trying to get to the point where we have a critical mass, where it is an expected culture within the university that you engage. I'll leave it at that.
interested in this in your manifesto saying that different departments have different needs and um, they should design. So at what kind of level does each department get autonomy in terms of, I mean, could you just talk about that a bit? Um. Okay. Um, I mean, the question of autonomy is a tricky one. Um, within our university, there's lots of complicated discussions about questions of autonomy, uh, autonomy. So, for example, one of the issues that we're arguing about at the moment is the degree to which individual schools, which contain departments within them, should be financially autonomous and self-sustaining, as it were, um, which is not a traditional situation for a university. Uh, it, traditionally in universities, you know, if, if, if the engineering lot make a lot of money one year, the surplus is sent to other, to other um, departments to kind of prop them up. Because, let's face it, continuity of knowledge over time is a crucial obligation of all universities. Um, this is this business about super tankers. Um, and it is the case that, you know, some, some topic is particularly, shall we say, popular amongst students for five years. And the, for the next 10 years, there are lean years for that. And the truth of the matter is, though, if you stop and start different bits of a university, you end up with a lack of continuity of expertise that seriously compromises that university. It also compromises that university's simple capacity to actually serve the needs even of governments. I mean, I can think here classically, for example, of the situation the British government found itself in, and in fact the British Secret Service found itself in, in 1979, when they turned around and the, the Iranian revolution had occurred, and they turned around and said, "How right, we will go to the universities to get lots of translators that speak Farsi, that, you know, that speak Iranian. And, and what they discovered is that all of the departments that taught it had been closed down five years beforehand because there weren't enough students. Um, and that simple problem um, is one about continuity. I mean, this is a problem to a certain extent with the simple... I, I have no problem with universities being business-like, but they have to do the business they're designed for. Universities are charities. They are designed to disseminate knowledge and education to the public benefit. Um, and that means there are certain elements of other business work they can't do. But it's also what makes them successful. And being a charity, by the way, gives you a massive tax exemption. And that's a... So I, I have a problem with that. But the problem is that universities actually have to do their work. Research, for example, you know, my research, to get myself to here, I'm a Tibetan specialist, to get myself to the point where I can speak with any great authority, and I work on parliamentary stuff at Hollywood and everything on those lines, has taken 30 years. Now, if I stopped and started all the way along there, with apologies to you, if I stopped and started all the way along there as a consequence of total precariousness, depending on how many people wanted to go to a Tibetan class, I would not actually be able to do the work I, I do now. Our, Careers go over decades. Research takes years. Education, our educational actual, our impact on communities is intergenerational. By contrast, for example, the average, the average Fortune 500 company has a life expectancy of 12 and a half years. My university is 500 years old. Okay. The, Choosing a kind of specifically business model in this regard and saying, well, we're going to cut that product because no one's buying it at the moment and instead move to that product actually is a very short-term policy and that is precisely the kind of thing that universities are not meant to be doing. They are meant to be providing quite a different service to the world around them. And they are meant to be providing a service to the world around them. We're not meant to be just doing what's interesting to us. But we're meant to be providing something that requires continuity. And if that's the case, then this kind of, um, should we say, segregation, which we have at the University of Edmonton at the moment, is, in my opinion, as a senator, is a bad, bad idea. At the same time, each of us live in a discipline which has specific requirements and specific kind of, should we say, analytical worldviews, specific different ethical and professional qualifications, all of those kinds of things. And they feed into the un a university from the outside. 
I'm an anthropologist. We have a specific set of codes. I, my uh, code, I, ethical code I sign up for is the uh, ASA's code, for example. Lawyers have a different one. The medics have an entirely different one again. Which means if you standardize across the board, you will often find that the first thing that, you, the first thing that happens is various professional bodies desert you. Uh, because what occurs in university is incredibly diverse. It is vastly diverse. The only thing that can, I mean, here I speak in favor of sense. Well, I said that a senior management cannot create a single template that will work for an entire university. A Senate possibly can if you have a large Senate. But even then, you're, you've, got to, you've got to expect that there are going to be a lot of rows. Because at some point, disciplines do need a level of autonomy. Does that answer your question? Thanks. So today we were talking about these attacks from uh, governments and particularly the prevent but also tier 4 policies and how does this double level of struggle um, enable you to resist or uh, what's your stance in, on that? Ooh. Okay, prevent. Can I? Uh, uh, tier 4 regulation. <sighs> okay. Um, well, tier 4 is never much fun for anyone. <laughs> um, universities struggle across the board with that. Um, uh, I'll deal with prevent first. I, I, I'll say what I said earlier, which is that universities need to engage in their own level of self-governance over this question and the way in which they respond to it. Uh, prevent, if you, as I said, you move management up to a, the top where in effect they are responding and passing down directly demands that are coming from external stakeholders, most particularly governments, then often things like prevent get thrown in directly. But I'll speak personally, which is that most university administrators that I've ever met are completely terrified by the prevent laws. They, they, personally, they often seriously don't like them. Their response to not liking and being terrified by them is often to be risk averse, which produces the kind of self-policing problems that, we've, that we often see. It's not actually because they like the policies. That, um, that they engage in things which are often deleterious to students, staff, teaching, all of those kinds of things. It's often because they don't like them. Um, now, in that regard, maintaining the, from my perspective, and I'm going to speak here, maintaining the academic probity of a university's life, and that is essential, requires senators to engage. And as I say, one of the things we have at Aberdeen, for example, is as of June, um, we have an agreement that the, the law that says that within a university, and the law does say this, or, or the guidance says this, that within a university there needs to be, effectively speaking, a committee that is given over to responding to, to prevent matters and prevent cases. That body should report back to Senate, not to a Senate committee, but to the Senate as a whole. It's an absolute hole. Why? Because 120 people have a higher chance of spotting what's wrong with it than five other people. Um, and because it is a public transparency matter. And in a university, Senate is the closest thing you get to public transparency. Most of us don't use general counsels anymore. Uh, theoretically, the University of Edinburgh, for example, does have a general council of 193,000 members. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I believe, generally speaking, probably like most other universities, about 12 people actually turn up. Uh, whereas Senates are, as I say, they're quite large bodies, and they're quite, they're quite public bodies in, in our university. Ordinary people can go to it. They can't necessarily speak at it or vote, but they can go to it. Um, so it's the nearest thing we have to public transparency. And I think that's the best way of dealing with prevent, personally. Um, hello, I, I would like to, to say two things. Uh, the first one is thank you very much. Uh, it, it produces some hope. What you, it gives us hope mm. that things can be done. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would like to ask you, any of you, um, 
you know, I, uh, part of my research is on what is going on in sociological, even anthropological terms. And uh, from the point of view of the prospects that similar initiatives and a broader, perhaps, initiative that encompasses Jews and it, 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 the prospects of this uh, emerging and advancing, how do you see the following thing? Is that the things are evolving in such a way that we have nowadays a very powerful managerial stratum who moves from university to university, managerial positions, who aspires to pack a lot of money, um, you know, who, uh, and they uh, pass through universities and what they leave behind is, you know, uh, so how, how can we uh, deal with this? What can, uh, how do you see it? I know it's, a, it's not an easy question, but I mean, from the point of view of, uh, you know, taking this further to other universities and, um, and to the whole country. Thank you. Can I, can I add to Carlos's question? Because I, I wondered if you could say what you thought were the major um, points of resistance that you faced in this process. What were the diff I mean, we've heard a lot about how it worked and so on, but what were the difficulties? Because I think those understanding what those are uh, are also important. So just if you allow me to add to your Okay. Um, all right. The major difficulty is with ordinary academics and persuading them to bloody well stand up and fight for, their, for, for what they have a responsibility for. Sorry, I've got to be blunt about that. Most academics want to be afraid. And they are often very, very good at imagining things that they are imagining terrible consequences from people with great powers, you know, kind of mega mind with sort of, <laughs> and, and, and they fail to deal with people. Uh, administrators and management, and I know, I know exactly the kind of person you're talking about, and I, we have dealt with exactly the kind of people that you're talking about, which is a sort of mobile elite within universities who have jobs as sort of hatchet men and things on those lines. Well, there's still people, there's still, you need to talk to them, and you need to identify what they actually want. This is very important, actually. A lot of the time you find that they are responding to a particular need, often quite an expedient need that's pushing on them from a particular direction, and they come up with a solution. And that solution has a wide-ranging effect because of the managerial structure. And because it has that wide-ranging effect, you kind of sort of see it as this kind of global overarching thing. But often you need to just sit there, and you actually need to go and I'm afraid the footwork has to be done. You've got to go to their offices, you've got to sit down across the table opposite and say, what do you need? Because what you're, the answer you're giving is not, is damaging, or is inadequate, or doesn't work, or has the following problems, and can we suggest some alternatives? I'm afraid to say, you know, just sort of saying this is bad is not enough. You actually, and Truth be told, you know, how many academics are there in Edinburgh University? What is it, 5,000? Something like that? That's a lot of brain power. That's a lot of imagination. You know, as long as those people are prepared and have mechanisms for getting those ideas up there, for getting those ideas into a proper negotiated format, uh, a, a place where you can actually sit down and say, well, okay, so you're doing this because there's a 1% cut in the Scottish Funding Council allowance. You know, what other ways are there to deal with that? But if you just sort of stand on the outside and kind of go, we really don't like what you've done, but we're not going to provide you with an alternative, we're just going to complain about you, nothing will ever get better. The truth of the matter is, again, it's, this, it's simply this point. The hardest thing here and believe me, I know, because it was really hard, is to change the heart in here so that it understands its responsibility and obligation to governance. And that applies to all of us, and it comes from the very privilege that has a career based on the pursuit of truth. 
we have to do that thing. And it takes a very long time. And in my case, it took a lot of really, really bruising negotiations where people, including, I hasten to add, on several occasions, me, left the room in tears. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a series. Now, there have been some, some hard resistance on other areas. And one of them are about, indeed, general senses of hierarchy. Um, and a lot of that emerges from an us versus them problem. That if you think that kind of, if you th say things in terms of, well, it's us, we're down here, we're fighting against the horrible management up there and everything on those lines. And you sort of say, so we're going to reform. The instant logical conclusion of that from, you know, a, a vice principal's perspective is going to be, I'm going to be chucked out of a job and in the street by this process. And that's not necessarily where we're going. The process here is oddly an educational process in which everyone finds out what the best way to do something is in the most effective way. It's not necessarily a, a, a battle that leads blood on the carpets and corpses in the streets, um, I think, anyway. Uh, so one of the things here is to actually modulate in your head the problem of threat. Academics think they're constantly under threat. And we're great at imagining lots of ways in which that could possibly, possibly happen. As a consequence, we keep our heads beneath the parapet. And we come up with a lot of practical reasons, practical political reasons, as to why we're not going to stand up and be counted. We're really good at it. The problem with it is the guys old in, in, in senior management are suffering from the same threat problem. And you have to get past that. And the only way to get past that, I'm afraid to say, is actually sitting in people's offices and talking to them. And sort of sitting down and saying, what's your problem? What, how can we sort it out? What are the alternatives that are genuinely, genuinely available? And that's a simple governance process. And it's the job that we're always meant to have done. So there we go. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you for the lesson learned from Aberdeen. But can you tell more about the time the timeline, because you mentioned about 10 years ago when you reorganized the Senate oh. and, and doing the self-governing things. But um, that's all thing also related to the taking ownership, you know, not giving it to somebody else to govern the university. Um. And, but I want to know the timeline from 10 years ago. When is actually the critical time when you're able to recapture again? Yeah, because we're talking about stamina here. Thank you. Um, okay, the, yes, as I say, I, I think about that moment. Uh, when I first, I, I, I love the University of Aberdeen, by the way. I think it's a great place. I'm very, very loyal to it. Um, I have, I probably aren't going somewhere else unless they sack me, which may well happen. Um, but when I arrived, I, it was a When I arrived 16 years ago from the University of Sussex, where we were all quite radical back then, um, it was a uh, very, uh, un it, was, it, was a, it was quite a sort of docile population. Um, we get a disturbingly low quantity of graffiti uh, from students and things, uh, students and staff both, and it's, 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 it's quite quiet. Um, so I, I don't want to give the impression this is, has been just something that happened 10 years ago, but it was, it was the case that it was quite a hierarchical system by culture. Um, and as I say, about 10 years ago, what with the REF, the research assessment exercises and all of those kinds of things, um, there was a wish for people to kind of get on with that um, teaching and research element of things. And as I say, Senate did a variety of things. The first one, for example, was it removed all of the professors from Senate um, because it didn't like the... F and there were lots of good reasons for that, but one of the consequences of which is you got rid of all of the people that weren't, look that, that weren't worried about being promoted. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if you've already got your promotion and you're already a professor and everything on those lines, you can afford to be a bit more mouthy. Um, but we also passed all of this sort of stuff across. And, there was a period of time, and, and I think, as I say, I think with us, the, sort of the, 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 it created a structure whereby, whereby initiation, initiatives sort of just fell down, and there was almost nothing to sort of stop them on the way down. And actually, we would sit there and we would say, 
we don't like this and we're told it's come from the top, there's nothing you could do. I mean, sometimes stuff will come directly from vice principals and everything on those lines. And, and as I say, much of that derived from that structural shift within Senate. Um, when did we start changing it? Okay, we started changing it last September. We rewrote the rules of Senate within three months. Um, we have just, we actually have a Senate on Wednesday, sorry, I shouldn't, but we, we have a Senate on Wednesday um, when the, the Senate assessor member's proposal for the, re for the restructuring of court goes through. And we will vote on that. Um, we insisted on a whole variety of processes. It used to be the case, for example, that you went into Senate and there were 120 people sitting around and, and the, sort of, you know, the, the principal who was chairing it, um, and I'm speaking here of another principal, would sort of sit there and say, everyone seems quite happy with that. <laughs> and everyone would go. And that would be it. We now have a system whereby, for example, you cannot have something pass through Senate without an explicit vote. You know, the Senate before last, we voted 42 times in a single Senate. Um, yeah, sorry, we got rigorous and we insisted on those changes. And it, it has made it all a lot more hard work. But that, and we insisted on remit changes, for example. So that occurred over um, three months between last September and, and the, the sort of January-ish. Um, and... Um, lots of other changes, for example, over the terms and conditions have occurred since March. Um, we've had a busy year. It's been a year. Um, we've achieved an awful lot. And I, I think things are better. <laughs> Got a long way yet to go, though. Yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed this panel and the whole day and the opportunity to meet people from all over the place, so thank you for, for that. Um, I wanted to bring up a couple of things because I'm sitting here listening to your account and I love this account of this two-pronged process. Part of me is sat here thinking as somebody who's not working in a major city where students come from all over central Scotland, a lot of the staff commute as well. It would be very difficult to set this process up where I am, although we could try, um, although um, we're going to have to try. <laughs> um, and it does make you feel more isolated working in a smaller institution um, and probably increases the sense of risk that academics have in that particular situation. And taking on board what Eleanor said about also this need to reach out. I'm thinking that we also need to develop processes for keeping in touch internationally and also to visualise what's going on. Um, we can have a lot of academic discussion, which is great, I love that. Um, but I think it's great that this is being recorded and hopefully there will be um, an edited um, presentation today. I'd also like to mention, I'm a men member of the Visual Studies Working Group of the International Sociological Association. And this summer, we were trying to think of ways to create a kind of international platform to which people could upload videos or other forms too, um, in which people explain what's going on where they are. We, we came up with three questions. I mean, people can criticize that and suggest something different. It would be interactive. It's not happened yet. We're working on it. But I was hoping uh, to circulate details of it to people who've come today, um, but also give this, war this prior warning so you know what it is that I'm possibly not explaining in the best way in an email. But that, that's a specific example, but I, I think that it, we need to think in those terms as well because Eleanor's right, universities don't get the political attention they need in this country, probably in others, um, because of this perception that we're this ivory tower or um, that what goes on in universities doesn't matter really for the rest of society. You, you, well, you, you all know what I'm talking about here, but um, yeah.
it's probably not transformative enough. But, but maybe it could become. I, I would say, by the way, I would say, and I, I do need to say this, you know, because when we started this process, a lot of people were like, should we have secret email accounts so that we could talk to one another and, uh, and, and, and all of these things? Um, I mean, okay, it's just been a year, and, but there has been no retribution. You know, it used to be you sort of sat there and said, if you said something awkward in Senate, everyone would kind of wheel their chair away from you and hope that, you know, sort of hide slightly and think that, you know, your card was marked. Now, obviously, that's a question of persons again. Yeah. I, what I'm saying is not that there isn't a will. Yeah. It's just sometimes the practicality. No one will do this for you. Yeah. No one will do this for you. You either do it yourselves or you don't do it yourselves. But I'll tell you something. You will never win a fight that you don't fight. It's as simple as that. And so you can, I mean, we can, we can sort of spread the word on this kind of matter and everything on those lines. But the truth of the matter is we have actually found this a lot easier than we thought it was going to be. We found this vastly easier. All that we decided was that we got the shock from the redundancies that forced us into action. I suppose there's things such as, there are bodies such as the Council for the Defence of British Universities. I've never been a big, big fan of that title, but um, it sort of sounds strangely. Yeah, and there's amazing. also the Campaign for the Public University. University, indeed. Yeah. So there are a number um, of different um, initiatives. Any more interventions, comments, questions?